Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around, perhaps with beverage in hand, talking about anything and everything. We may use explicit language, but we're hardly the most obscene thing you'll hear this week, or probably even today, so consider us PG-13. Your host today is John Schmidt. This is episode 38, Interview with the Swordmaster. Take it away, John. This is Writers Drinking Coffee. Hosted today by John Schmidt, our guest is Stephen Fick, who runs a martial arts school and will be talking to us about writing sword fights. So, Stephen, what's your experience with swords? I started fighting with armor in 1989. For 30 years, I fought with European bladed weapons, everything from long sword, side sword, rapier, dagger... I even had a fight in the basement of a castle drunk by lantern light. I mean, I've been. How did you get the castle drunk? Uh, well, oh, wait, you sorry, would be no, surprised. Yeah. The casks that are inside. Oh, big casks. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've been. I've done a lot of different things. I've uh, played with and choreographed fights with the Balasong as well, the butterfly knife. Mm-hmm. Um, I have now fought and competed, uh, competed and taught on three different continents. I've worked for universities. I've been into the basements of museums. I've done classes for everything from first grade through the UC History Department. And didn't you have a um, dirty job segment as well? I've had two of those. I did a two. episode with Mike Rowe on Somebody's Got to Do It. I taught him a little bit of sword fighting. And then he saw the armor and he really wanted to get into armor. So we put him in armor. And I told him this will be, we'll go for 60 seconds. This will be the longest 60 seconds of your life. And he's in good shape. He said, I can do anything for 60 seconds. At about 43, he was ready to vomit. Because it's a whole different thing being in a helmet where you're breathing a lot of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Not to mention having the stress of somebody trying to hit you with a sword. Or somebody successfully hitting you with a sword, as I remember. I also worked on a show with Adam Savage. Really? Called uh, Savage Builds. Mm -hmm. He is a total sword geek. I love it. Uh, he knows the guys at Weta down in San Diego. Mm-hmm. He, his, what got him into it, he was telling me, was Excalibur. And I did a lot when I was early with Excalibur and watching that. and So we just had a great time together. But on his show, I taught him how the mechanics of swinging a sword, that when we try to muscle it, it doesn't work. So form over strength. Yes. Excellent. Moving to a writing question. I, uh, I have a list of questions. What is your favorite... We're sitting in his library, which is wonderful because on the other side is the bar. And it's also wonderful because I am next to a mass of books ranging from the Renaissance at War to Arms and Armor Manuals to Parker's The Roman Legions. I'm just sort of looking at them to one of my favorites, Payne Galloway's The Crossbow which is uh, a very interesting book if you look at it history. history. And uh, so, obviously, when you can sit in a library with a swordsman, what's your favorite book? In, let's go both fictional and non-fictional. Right now, uh, I'm reading The Viking Art of War, which mm-hmm. looks at the boats and the techniques of the Vikings, along with the... Uh, Art of War of King Arthur. So looking at the techniques of the early to mid-6th century after the Romans left Britain. But for my favorite books, I think fiction is Abercrombie. Abercrombie. I I love his books. Can you name some of them? Uh, Heroes, um, uh, The Heroes... There's there's a whole sequence, uh, the gallows, 
there's a whole sequence of those. Those are just some of the best battle scenes I've ever read uh, because it's not shock value, but it's mm-hmm. gritty. It's not uh, clouds and puffballs either. You know, the good guy doesn't always win, and he's not comfortable. And so I really like the way he writes his battle scenes. Uh, But I also like the mental side of it, because one of the reasons I have a library is hitting things is easy. Any monkey can swing a stick. It's not about hitting something. It's about understanding when, why, where, and how you want to hit them. If you and I get into a fight on the ground... But you are my lord's oldest son. Even though I could easily dispatch you, I better not. Mm -hmm. So I need to know what I can and can't do within certain constructs of the fight. Which holds true today. If I get in a fight out on the street and I punch a guy and he falls over and cracks his head open on the curb, I'm up for manslaughter. Mm -hmm. So it's knowing when, where, and how to fight not just hitting it so the other one the other book that I want to talk about fiction is uh, Louis McMaster Bujold Louis Louis McMaster Bujold I love her books the Vorkosigan saga not uh, not her Penrith series I like her Penrith but I really like the Miles Vorkosigan character because he's always the warrior's apprentice yeah he's always uh, he doesn't have the same gifts that everybody else has so he has to use his mind so well he, he is the son of the regent you know rich powerful family the fact that he was crippled before birth and is very fragile in a very military society and considered a mutant in a, a mutant in a where society a place where that, mutants yeah. are killed yeah uh, and another series like that is butcher the oh, I was blank on the name of it um you're talking about Jim Butcher, though? Yes, Jim yeah. Butcher. Uh, he is... He has uh, the Captain's Fury, the Fury series. Mm-hmm. Um, Allegra or something. Uh, no, that's not right. I, I can see the cover, but I can't remember And the name. I just blanked on the name of it. And we will put all the names in the links for the show when we yeah. get there going back through it. Um, both of those novels, however, focus more on a tactical level rather than a t- technique level. So I'm going to ask the question slightly differently. Mm-hmm. And I'm, let's include media because a lot of people, and actually that's a second question I'll ask you in a minute, a lot of people are becoming aware of historic weapons forms through fantasy media. Right. What individual engagement, what sword fight seems best to you? And I'm going to throw in an example. Uh, I noticed that they actually changed forms in the Princess Bride in the famous duel yes. on the top of the cliffs. They were naming forms, and I, I couldn't tell if they were accurately mimicked them. I assume not. But the fact that they were showing different sword postures and forms made that somewhat of a delight. One of the interesting things about that fight is it had absolutely nothing to do with the styles historically. Mm-hmm. But that's not a media's job. A media's job is to entertain. What they did do is the four masters that they named are real masters, Mm -hmm. and we have books from three of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the interesting things is Capofero, Agrippa, they're drawn in the nude. Mm -hmm. And the reason is so that when we look at the manuscript, we're able to look at the musculature. In Capoferro, his famous lunge position where he's showing the lunge, when you look at it, you can see a split on his back foot between the big toe and the second toe. That tells you where your balance should be in this fully extended position, Mm -hmm. which is called Guardia Extraordinario, the the Extraordinary Guard. Or Stretched Guard is another way to look at it. Yeah. So, all of that there, and... When we start looking mm-hmm. at the tactical versus the technique based, mm-hmm. if you look at techniques, it's like learning a speech by rote. You have that speech in place, but if somebody asks you a question, you are unable to give them the correct answer. 
and a fight, regardless of the tool you're using, is only a conversation between two or more people. My goal is to learn how to listen to another person because I can't give you the correct answer unless I'm able to hear you. That is a really positive and nice goal. I would say my goal is to learn how to possibly shout you down. But then again, the art I have practiced in the past involves uh, shield bashing and knocking people down. So. Right. And if I go head on and head on to with you, you're bigger than me. You're going to run right over me. That being the case. But if you sidestep, you get to hit me in the back of the head. Yes. I met a guy in armor for the first time. We were friends for many, many years. Uh, met him in armor, and he scared the bejeebers out of me because he ducked his head and charged me. And it just surprised me because I wasn't even, uh, I wasn't set yet, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden he was on me. And habit training took over. I used the back edge of my sword, tapped him in the side of his head, so he fell over, spun it around. I was ready to do a morch slog, mm -hmm. a hammer strike to his skull on the ground because he surprised me. Right. And halfway through, I stopped it. It's like, oh, not that fight. Not that yeah, fight. But your training took over. So us uh, and uh, gentle listeners, you can't see it, but we are both rather large, muscular men. He's in better shape than I am, clearly. And certainly he runs a martial arts school in Santa Clara, so I imagine he would be. Uh, let's talk about gender for a moment, because there was a, an interesting comment made about two months ago, a month or two months ago, that women cannot fight with a sword, based uh, on The Witcher, I believe. What a tool. Yes, there is a fantastic book. I've got it here in my library. It's called The Armored Rose. I love that book. By Elena Beckingham. Yes. Toby Beck or Elena Beckingham. And CA. That book started me on my search to understand women and how their bodies move. Most martial arts instructors are men. Therefore, they try to get the women to move like them, which physiologically, women aren't built the same. Everything from the wrist, elbow, shoulder, hips, knees. I tell my ladies here that all of them have a superpower. And I exhibit that. We stand next to each other with our feet together, pointing at the wall right in front of us. And then I say, without moving your feet, turn around and point at the wall behind you. Mm -hmm. And she can always move about half again as far as any guy can mm -hmm. without hurting themselves. So from a street, straight speed contest, women have the advantage. From a structural base... Women have a stronger lower body. And the reason for that is when you look at men's legs going from the hips, they go straight down to the ground. Mm -hmm. When you look at women's hips or legs, they go down from the hips, hit the knees. There's kind of a bulge on the inside of the knees, and their legs kick out just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that gives them a wider lower base than men. And so physiologically, they have that advantage. But if I try to make... A woman stand like I do in my class she hurts and women are tougher than men men will whine and complain and stop when it hurts women have been told their whole life you've got to work twice as hard to get half as much so just push your way through it and so they'll keep going through the pain thinking I must be doing something wrong or I'm out of place because it's working for him and so they end up getting hurt because they're tougher than we are mm -hmm. but be, that book got me started on really studying the difference between men and women's bodies to teach them and let them use their uh, their physical attributes to their greatest effect. Would you recommend that to other sword fighters to get better understanding of the gender difference? I would actually recommend that two books for, for the martial arts. That mm -hmm. one, which is really good for any martial art. Because the way we train here, whatever I have in my hand, whether it's a sword, a knife, a stick, or just my fist, that's only my tool. Mm -hmm. My weapon is my brain. I sharpen my weapon so I can use any tool. And regardless of the martial arts you're studying, when, if you're working with mm -hmm. men or women, they have to move 
differently. Mm -hmm. The other book is called, and it's a dumb title, but I love the book. It's called The Book of Martial Power. The Book of Martial Power. And I, I think it's a dumb title. It doesn't give it away. It doesn't tell what it is. But the nice thing about the book is that it really focuses on the concepts and the principles that make the art work. The generation of sword strike power or the generation of mental power? Physical power. Physical power. Right. Uh, but not just my physical power to you. When I teach people how to fight... Our standard is that everybody's stronger than you, everybody's faster than you, period. And if I know my opponent is stronger and faster than me, I have to be smarter than them. Okay. So it's not about me overpowering you. It's about me positioning you in such a way that you are weaker than me. If I play Mercy with a 102-pound lady she can still throw me to the ground if she has the right angle. If she goes straight on, mass to mass, I'm going to win every time. Mm -hmm. So it's not about being stronger than them. It's about making them weaker than you. And it's not about being faster than them. It's about making them slower. Okay. Because speed is a lie. Uh, if... I, one of my examples I use is I'll have somebody throw a punch hit me in the hand so good faster 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 then I'll say okay how fast were you going pretty good you were going hundreds of thousands of kilometers per hour because we're on a giant rock hurtling through space mm -hmm. speed is an illusion the amount of distance you need to travel is the truth so if you need to travel further than I need to I will be faster than you mm-hmm and that's how we make them slower. Well, and I'm going to interject here smoother too. Because for me, the most fascinating thing is waking up when someone has a strike of some form in whatever art halfway to me because I didn't recognize it as a strike. Right, yeah. And one of the fighters in the Society for Creative Anachronism who used to be able to hit me almost at will was just so smooth that I didn't trigger that he had actually thrown a shot until the sword was partway to my head. There's a gentleman in the SCA. His name is Robert Childs. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a total man crush on his ability for fighting. He has the most un definitive understanding of time and distance within the fight and control. He can pick you apart. It's amazing to watch him fence. That's what we all attain to. That's what we hope to attain. A fight is nothing more than a physical negotiation. So going back to writing, you've talked about some of your favorite authors. Uh, I'm going to be unfortunately negative and ask, is there anything you've seen or read recently where you just go, ugh? Yes, by all means. There's a, there's a book up here. So in the library, the section you're sitting by is battles throughout history. Mm -hmm. The section I'm sitting by is arms and armor from different periods. And then we have photocopies of the original manuscripts and translations and interpretations. Mm -hmm. There's a book over here about Towards me. Uh, in the battle section about uh, battles in the Dark Ages. And that first thing is what sets my, my warning bells going. The Dark Ages. Right. Um, but I remember reading through that and seeing so many discrepancies between what he's writing and what I've read in other books mm -hmm. that I think I only made it halfway through the book because I just couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> I have actually found recently um, that the overall quality of writing about ancient martial arts and uh, sword arts, even modern, has improved, in my opinion, because people are have more access to both the original manuals, uh, even as we speak, people are reading those and redoing them, translating them and bringing them back alive, and to experimental archaeology, where you you don't just read a book and say, oh, well, this is the, the history, this is must be so, You're, you 
your Latin club used to go out and build a trebuchet and, and put people in armor. Well, now there are multiple groups where you can go build a trebuchet and, and sling, hopefully safer than giant rocks, <laughs> at your friends and see if your testudo really works. The uh, There's another one over here um, where... It is the it's called it's a book called Blood Red Roses and it's over in the battle section mm-hmm. second shelf down mm-hmm. and it is an archaeological dig at the Battle of Taunton from the War of the Roses mm-hmm. and it's a mass grave and they look at the archaeologically they look at the injuries whether it's post mortem or peri mortem mm-hmm. to see what type of physical stru- structure they were in before they died, what kind of diseases they had, what their tooth decay was like, mm-hmm. but then what were the wounds that killed them, and which ones did they survive? And on the front of that book is a picture of this guy who's just scary looking. About 10 years before he died at this battle, he took an axe or a sword blow to the side of his face that cut through, uh, broke the jaw here, Mm -hmm. knocked out three teeth, and the the structure was so hard that it broke the front of his mandible as well. Mm -hmm. And that was about 10 years before he died. So as I tell my guys here in school, dying is hard to do. Because, especially in today's world, because we, the body is amazingly tough. And we have great medical advances. Mm -hmm. comparatively speaking but yet at the same time the human body is so fragile Mm -hmm. and breaks so easily so it's a neat um, double side that we need to work with okay one of the questions Jeannie wanted asked how would you write a fight scene let's set it up very simply let's say I have case of swords I have Mm -hmm. um two long swords and I catch you in your library reading and all you have is and you can't see it here but he has a, what uh, a strong he's got looks to be a caiman looks to be a claw ah yeah that's my uh, that's George my uh, stuffed caiman yeah George and, and behind George is a dagger or sword about two feet long so I've got four feet of, of steel on him well three feet depending on how you look at it how long the rapier is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Talk through a fight scene real quick. You you get to win. All right. You can decide whether I bleed out or I'm cut or you just dominate me. And let's go ahead and set it in this library. So we have a room, doorway, uh, center of bookshelves, bar on the other side, chairs. We're in a cluttered environment. I come upon you. I'll come through the door and challenge you. You it's pet so- George and grab your sword. Sword's drawn. I actually don't go for my sword. Okay. Your swords are drawn. You walk through the door, both swords. Because you're entering the door, you have a limited amount of space to move. Mm-hmm. First thing I do is book in my hand goes at your head. Okay. Which forces you back just a step. That puts you back in the door jam, which means your swords are a little bit less. At that point, I grab two books and throw them down at your feet. Okay. So now you have a tripping tool. Mm-hmm. Then, as you come forward, you you come back in. You step forward. You hit the book, but you're a you're a smart fencer, a fighter. You've been in this. You don't trip. I was hoping, but we mm-hmm. don't get it all the time. But as you step in, that gives me the chance to grab my Crockett, my Cayman, George, mm-hmm. and toss it at you. You bat it aside, but because you bat it aside, you took one sword to the same side as the other sword. Now I do a body check, and I charge you. Okay. And I step in under your arm. We both hit the wall. You protect me with your body, unhappily for you. Then, as I bounce off you, I roll out of this corner towards the bar. That's where the bottles come in. Now, while I can't use the bottles to deflect I throw a bottle at you and as you come at me I turn the door the chair that's over by the bar and push that into your knees mm-hmm. that makes your body come forward and you you bend over the back of the chair 
that's when I grab one of your swords, disarm you of that sword, and instead of turning the sword to use at you, I just drive it forward with a pommel strike to the nose. This forces you back, bleeding with your eyes watering. And as you regain your posture and your surroundings and wipe the tears out of your eyes, I push the chair into you again because it's in my way as well. Mm -hmm. Then as you get pushed out of the way off balance, that's when I will strike you with the sword. Whether I want it to be a killing blow or a wounding blow is dependent on who you are and why we're in this fight and what I'm worried about with the repercussions. If there are no repercussions, I'm going to pin you to the wall like a butterfly. I'm not that pretty. <laughs> Maybe a moth. If I am worried about the repercussions, I'm going to pin you to the wall, but through your shoulder. Okay. Wow, that's an exciting fight scene. And you've given me both knowledge and a good drink from the sound of it. There we go. And George has gotten to see a little more of the world <laughs> because he's not sitting on himself. Thank you. That was fun. Uh, tell us a little bit. L l let me ask. If I wanted to come to one place oh my God, to uh, see you and learn something, uh, you have schools. Where do you have schools? What's, what are your big things to come and do and see? Well, we are slowly taking over the world, one city at a time. Okay. We have a, our main chapters in Santa Clara, California. Mm -hmm. We have another chapter at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. We have another chapter in Midland, Texas. And we're getting ready to open up a chapter in North Bay in Alameda, California. Okay, so two in the Bay Area. But I travel around and teach as well. And one of the biggest events that I teach at is... This month, I'm going to an event in Texas run by the chapter, our chapter in Texas. Mm -hmm. But then the international event that I'm going to teach at here in the U.S. is called Combat Con in Las Vegas at the end of July. That has uh, instructors from all over the world, martial artists, actors, stuntmen, authors. We all gather there and... Uh, share information from that will go from one medium to another one medium to another so yeah so we so can, as an author there i could talk to i could have a similar conversation to this with you maybe we'll start in the bar and end up in the library rather than the other way around right um are there writer's tracks at that i believe there are writer's tracks there are also there are panels that people mm -hmm. can attend uh that cover a variety of subjects there are physical classes that people can take there's also a vendors area and a um an area where people can come in and do things like we offer sword fighting lessons there mm -hmm. as well as me teaching classes but one of the good things that you can do there is you can work and talk with bladesmiths and talk about different weapons you can hold a variety of weapons. Mm -hmm. Being able to write a fight scene, it makes so much more sense when what you're writing about you've held in your hand. If you, I did a choreograph, I choreographed a fight for an author using a ballast song. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I do that's unusual is that I do choreograph for movies and TV shows, but I also choreograph for authors and I help them develop the fight scene because in tv and movie you can see it but in the in the book you have to feel it in the written media i had no idea you would help authors that way so yeah that's that a, is a great piece of news to hear that's another service i offer excellent and i did this one fight for an author using a ballast song but the character was not allowed to kill any of them mm -hmm. so i was using the ballast song as a striking implement with the rotating handle. So when a punch came in, step to the side and snap the handle to their wrist. Mm -hmm. Take the handle upside the head so you hit them in the face. I think with, she was fighting four or five guys and she came out with several bruises, a uh, uh, cracked rib, but they were all laying on the ground, but none of them dead. And she used the ballast song, but never the blade. Mm -hmm. to 
to put them down. And for those of our listeners who don't know, a balasong is also called a butterfly knife. It's uh, a blade with two sections of handle. Normally you carry it with the handle concealing the blade, so it's safe. And if you see a movie where someone's flipping a knife object with loose handles around, that's a balasong, usually. Yes, and, and it's used a lot to make a character scary. Mm-hmm. Because they have the knife, and they, what you'll hear is a as it, they're flipping it around their hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a great tool. Um, I use it for me when I was in high school. It was my early fidget spinner. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's what we used it for. Excellent. Um, I'm afraid we've run close of time. We haven't run close of subjects, so we are going to ask you to come back on the podcast and talk more. If you've been listening and you have any questions that you'd like Stephen to answer, please send them in and we'll arrange for him to get them and get answers to you. Again, Again, you've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our web magic is brought to you by Deirdre McGaffey Schwain, and our sound engineer and backup web spider is yours truly, Dave Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Maid Milking a Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Engberg. You can hear more from Michael Engberg at manyhatsmusic.com. Today's episode is sponsored by the Whole Truth Paper Products Company. Remember, if it isn't the whole truth, it's a tissue of lies.